On behalf of the sponsoring assemblies of the Toronto Easter Bible Conference, we welcome you virtually today to view the Easter Conference. We're delighted that you're with us, and we're praying that by next year, we'll be able to get together physically at a venue. At this time, we'll call upon VG Roberts of the New Life Assembly to open our conference in prayer. VG. Dearly beloved in the Lord, grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as we start a conference, let's turn to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your son. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through your son. Thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to fall in love with your son. And in this season of time when people remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have come as your people who have been so transformed and the work that still continues because of your son. We thank you for his life, for his death, for his burial, for his resurrection. We remember what it meant, Lord, for him to come down and suffer for us. I remember, Lord, that verse from Luke where while your son was on the cross, as we, the people, accused him and said, if you are the Christ of God, the chosen one, come down and save yourself. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But what irony. But what lovely truth that it's in the death of your son that we should have life. That it's in the death of your son that we should be saved. That it's in the death of your son that death is put to death. And so in this time, a lot of, of pandemic where emotions are, are frail, because of isolation and even us lord we are not been we we're not able to come together and yet you have allowed us to come in this media we pray that whatever the challenge whatever the situation whatever it is that we are going through lord as we draw to the foot of the cross nay to the foot to the throne of grace itself we pray that you will reveal to us the glories of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be caught afresh with who your son is. Speak to our hearts, Lord. We have come with ready hearts. So as you have laid a message in your servant's heart as they speak to us, Lord, we pray that the light of the gospel would shine into our heart, into those very corners where we have raised idols reveal them to us lord so that we will we would be we would willingly destroy them because christ alone is our lord our savior may this time whatever we do lord be to your glory and the word that you have for us lord would be to our encouragement and to our building up and this i pray oh father for all of us whose heads are bowed and who pray this prayer with me that your um uh, Lord, your message would be the answer that we seek. We thank you. We love you. And we ask all this in the precious and the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, VG, for opening our conference in prayer. We're delighted to have for the first time Micah Tuttle with us virtually. Micah and Amy Tuttle have been married for 23 years. They have six children, three boys, and three girls. They've been commended by the Eastgate Bible Chapel in Portland, Oregon. In the year 2000, they went to Peru and got involved in mission work in the Andes Mountains and the Amazon rainforest. They were able to start a few churches and Bible schools. Presently, the Tuttles live in Dubuque, Iowa. His desire is to encourage a younger generation in evangelism, church planting, discipleship, and missions. The Lord has opened the door for Micah to do itinerant work in the USA 
and abroad. Our brother is a licensed electrician and a graduate of Emmaus Bible College. We're delighted to have him with us today and we call upon him to open the scriptures. Micah. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Easter Conference. Uh, to all of you that are tuning in from different places, maybe around the world, uh, mostly there in the Toronto area. And uh, I guess uh, presenting myself, my name is Micah Tuttle. My wife Amy and I and our six kids, we were missionaries in the jungles of Peru for about 18 years. And uh, now the Lord has brought us back to North America and uh, we find ourselves based in Dubuque, Iowa. That is where I am uh, bringing these messages to you from our camper. As you can notice, maybe the background isn't the greatest, but uh, what an honor to be able to uh, share from God's Word these seven messages that uh, I'm recording for all of you. I really wish that I could be there in person. I sort of despise doing recorded messages, uh, but uh, I guess that's better than nothing with all of the, the quarantines and lockdowns and things like that. So uh, recording these messages uh, from Dubuque, Iowa in my camper. Um, I really am passionate about the topic of biblical manhood, and uh, that is the topic that I want to address in these seven messages, and uh, I really want to, uh, to, to preach this. Uh, this is such an important thing. Men, where are the men? Where are the men? Men that, that lead, men that are warriors, men that really love their wives, uh, men that uh, know how to uh, be fathers to their children as, as examples, men that know how to work. Where are the men? And uh, so this is the topic that I want to bring to you. Um, um, I really want to come uh, at the, this topic from the person, uh, the Old Testament character of David. And, uh, and so, if you would open up your Bibles, if you have Bibles there, open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is where I'd like to start, the, the famous story about David and Goliath. David and Goliath, obviously, such a famous story that we all know very well. Um, it is often preached in, uh, or at least with flannel, flannel graphs and uh, everything like that, in, in Sunday schools to six and seven year olds. This is one of uh, the favorite Bible stories for kids. But uh, let me just read these verses, uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 to 49. And uh, if someone was to video this um, event, if this was on YouTube, or they made a movie of it, as graphic as it is in the scriptures, this would be the kind of uh, video or movie that we would not let our little kids watch. Uh, listen to this. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine, and David put his hand into his bag. He took out one of the stones, and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into the, his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. What a graphic, I mean, unbelievable, uh, gory, gory uh, picture that we get there as David slays the giant. So before we get into some of those things right there, I, I just want to return. This is our topic, biblical manhood. There is such a need for biblical men to be raised up. I mean, where are the men today? 
And this is why I want to touch on the topic of David. We see it here in David and Goliath, and and later on we're going to look at uh, focus in on on other stories. But uh, this guy, he's known as a man after God's own heart. The scriptures say that a, a man. There's so many things that we can learn from this, and uh, I understand. In the other messages, uh, the the other brother that's sharing, I think he's sharing from Psalm 23, which is obviously a psalm written by David. So um, what, uh, what an opportunity to talk about this topic of biblical manhood. Um, in our day and age, we need men of God who stand up and be just that, men. Men, where are the men? In this series, I, I want to talk about biblical manhood while looking at, at some of the life of King David. David is a warrior. David is a poet. David is a lover. He's a leader. He's a friend. He, he faces giants. He fights battles. He experiences victory and he experiences defeat. Uh, there is pain. We see tremendous pain in his life. And then we see tremendous joy also in his life. And, and all through this, all through his life, all through all the stories, we see a man that is a worshiper. He worships his God. The living God of the universe, our God, who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. G David worships this God of the universe. There are so many things that we can learn from the life of David. Uh, like I said, I've got seven messages here uh, about this man after God's own heart. And, and I'm going to take actually five of these messages and, and just focus in on David's great fall. His sin with Bathsheba. It serves as a tremendous warning to all of us. And I think that we would do well to heed that warning if we are going to see a real return to biblical manhood. Oh, that there would be a real return to biblical manhood here in the 21st century. Uh, before we get into the warnings from 2 Samuel 11, though, I'd like to give this message on David and Goliath. I think that this message, it, it will give us some context to that tragic story of David and Bathsheba. And, and I want to begin by looking, though, at how this man, he took down giants. He takes down Goliath. So in this first message, I want to show you how David faced opposition. Men, we must be able to face opposition. Listen, in this story, his brothers oppose him. The king, King Saul, opposes him. The Philistines oppose him. Goliath opposes him, obviously. Everybody in the story opposes David. But David is bold and confident in his God. I love it. I love it. And really, I just want to bring to you three points that you really see in three different uh, phrases, uh, in, in three different verses in, in this uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. So the first one is found in, in verse 10, where Goliath, he comes out before the ranks of Israel and he cries out, give me a man, give me a man. Give me a man to, to fight with me. Um, man, I, I just, I love those words, actually. I mean, I understand this is Goliath, the enemy of Israel. Um, he is defying the living God. But what what uh, an amazing message. It, just to, to take his words, I guess, out of context. Give me a man. Give me a man. Where are the men? I mean, Come on, it's, will the men please stand up? And, and can you imagine this Goliath, this giant, he's probably nine, ten feet tall. He, he big, burly, deep voice yelling out across the canyon. Can you imagine just hearing that, that giant voice crying out, Give me a man! Give me a man! And yet no men show up to fight the giant. For the space of 40 days, that's more than a month, and no men show up. So that's kind of the first thing that I want to focus on. Later in verse 29, we're going to see David says, Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? 
And then later on, uh, David in verse 46 is basically saying, is there not a God? Is there not a God in Israel? So those are kind of the three points, and I just want to touch on each one of these real quickly. Is there not a man? Is there not a cause? And is there not a God? So um, in, in this first uh, point, in focusing in on those words by Goliath himself, give me a man. So let me, let me just read that verse 10. The Philistine said, uh, Goliath said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Later on in verse 24, it says, And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and they were much afraid. Listen, one thing that I want to say here, and I think it comes out really clearly in this story, is uh, while unbelief flees, faith runs into the battle. While unbelief flees from the battle, faith runs into the battle. You see that later as David runs. It says that he runs up to the, the giant. He runs to cut off his head after, after he slings that stone into his forehead. David runs into the battle. I love it. So Goliath, he comes out morning and evening for 40 days, 40 days, morning and evening, crying out to the Israelite army, give me a man, give me a man. Now, there were a lot, thousands, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of male soldiers out there. But it seems that there was a real lack of manliness. This was a defining moment who would answer the call here? Where are the men? Where are God's champions? Where are the courageous ones who are willing to stand in the face of opposition? Fight the Lord's battles. Where are the valiant ones who trust in the one and only God of the universe and then trusting in that God can take down giants? Not in their own strength, but in the strength of the one who sends them. God himself. Where are the men like that? You know, uh, one of the best quotes that I've ever heard or ever read about biblical manhood, one of the best quotes is by a woman, Elizabeth Elliot. It, Elizabeth Elliot said this, the strength of manly character is forged in the fires of self-control and discipline. What a statement. <laughs> And this is a statement that's made by a woman about men, what, what men should be. The strength of men, manly character is forged in the fires of self-control and discipline. Oh, where are the men like that? They're just, they, they're self-controlled. They can control themselves. You know, a lot of times it's easy to control other people, maybe, but so difficult to control yourself. That sin nature and some of the, the lust oftentimes that, that rages within and the desires of the flesh to do wrong things against God's will. Oh, to control that self-control discipline to stand up and to do what is right, to work hard, to love your wife, to obey God. Those commands that we see really in Genesis chapter two, when man was first created, so there, back to the battlefield with Goliath here in 1 Samuel 17, no one responds, even though the call went out evening and morning for more than a month, Saul should have gone up against the giant. Saul was the, the closest thing to a giant in Israel. Remember when he becomes king, it says that he stands up, he's head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the nation. Saul's the closest thing to a giant in Israel. He's the king. He should be fighting these battles against the champion of, of the, the Philistines, against Goliath here. But no, we see that he's like trying to find other people to fight his battles for him. Isn't that a problem nowadays for so many men? We are passive so often. I find myself being passive 
wanting others to fight the battles that I should be fighting. What a lesson. What a lesson there. Saul should have gone out against the giant. Biblical manhood is almost non-existent, really, from the beginning of time until now. Maybe even more so now. This is a major problem that we're facing. Where are the Davids? They have always been a rare find. Later on, it says that David is a man after God's own heart. I already mentioned that, but wow, I mean, it is, it's quite an honor to receive a description like that, a man after God's own heart. Uh, those are the kind of guys that are few and far between. Women, young women, that, that singles that aren't married yet, look for a man like that. Search hard. It is hard to find them. In Acts 13, 36, it speaks of this same David, and it says, He, David, served his generation well. Oh, to be a man that serves my generation well. That, that stands up to fight the Lord's battles, those battles that are put in front of me, facing those giants that uh, my generation is facing. But to serve my generation well, making my God's name great among the nations. This story it gives an introduction here to a wartime hero, David of Bethlehem. He, he was just a shepherd. He's just a kid in, in this story. But with God's help, he was a giant killer. I love it. He's a giant killer. As Christians, applying this whole story to our present age, as Christians, we are facing giants today, aren't we? So many giants. There's the giant of abortion. There's a giant of, of pornography that is just destroying an entire generation. There's the giant of the homosexual agenda that's being pushed on us. There's the giant of radical Islam. There's the giant of racism. There's the giant of postmodernism. Uh, the giant of evolution and that theory that's being taught in our schools. These are the giant issues of our day. And then there's the everyday personal Goliaths that, that we all fight, that are different from e for each one of us. The, the giant of a, of a fallen nature that you have, that I have. The temptations, the thoughts, the attitudes, our words, our addictions sometimes. Relationships with other people. I mean, you have a whole lot of big, bad Philistines, you could say. Philistines that are coming after you, don't you? If you're honest and you think about it, those battles that are way raging within, and now you're facing Goliath. Most men today, it's sad, but don't even try to stand up to Goliath. They don't even try to fight those Philistines. It's just like we we kind of just cower in fear and 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 we flee or just kind of uh, roll over on the ground and we let Goliath destroy us. Oh, like little wimps. Uh, we, we give in to the slightest temptations. We have no self-control oftentimes, no self-discipline. I ask you, what kind of a man are you? Do giants go down when you're around? Do giants go down when you come into the battle? Verses 55 and 56, uh, we see in, in this, this 1 Samuel 17, Saul asks, who is this guy? <laughs> it's after David has slain the giant, and Saul's just like, man, who is this guy? Where is he from? Whose dad is this guy? Uh, can you imagine the newspaper headlines the next day after David slays the giant? Uh, newspaper headlines, uh, from, from the pasture to the palace is what happens really quickly after this. Or maybe it says, the, from lowly shepherd to giant slayer. From a no-namer to a rock star. Rancher's son is the savior in Israel. Faith in a slingshot. I mean, you could, you could all kinds of things that you could uh, say on the front, front lines, the, the headlines of the newspaper the next day. But uh, where are the men like this? And, and David, just a young man, youth, 
Young men that are listening to me right now, where are the young men that are men willing to fight in the Lord's battles? You know that passage in Hebrews chapter 11, um, you get to the end of, of that chapter and it's just, it's talking about these great men and women who through faith conquered and some of them suffered, some were tortured, uh, 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 some were martyrs, yet these men by faith trusting in their God, did great things. It, it, it's like the, the, the writer of Hebrews gets kind of to the end of himself as he's writing about these things, and he just gets to this point where he's like, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson and David, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were slain with the sword, they were tempted. They went about sheepskins and goatskins, being tempted, afflicted. Oh, I lost my place, but it just goes on and on right there about these men and women that who through faith, they conquered. Where are the conquerors like that today in the 21st century? Oh, let me use those words of the giant right now. Give me a man. Give me a man. Give me a man. And then there's this, this statement as we get a little bit farther into chapter 17. And I know I'm scattered. I'm looking at different different uh, lines here in this chapter 17. You're going to have to go through and read the whole chapter for yourself after this message and just think about some of these things um, just for the sake of time, trying to get get this message done in, in a timely manner. But uh, in, in chapter 17, verse 29, in verse 29, um, David is, is gone out to the battlefield and his brothers are there. I guess I'll, I'll just start in, in verse 26. At the end of verse 26, David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him and said the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills the giant. Verse 28, So Eliab, his br eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and he said why have you come down and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness I know your presumption and the evil of your heart for you have come down to see the battle and David said what have I done is there not a cause and uh is there not a cause uh, those words, it comes out differently in different translations, but uh, I really want to grab a hold of those words right now. Is there not a cause? David says this to his brother, and, and once again here we see that his brothers are against him. Uh, his brothers are against him, the Philistines are against him, the giants against him, everybody's against him. And uh, David just responds, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I mean, what a question. That is a great question to ask ourselves today. Is there not a cause? A and the answer is a resounding yes. Yes, there is a cause. There is a cause. The cause is to make our, na our God's name great. Our that is our cause. In, in this story, God's name is being mocked by the Philistines and by this giant in particular. His name is being mocked, and is and it just makes David's blood boil as he hears this this giant mocking, defying the living God and his armies. So look at what David says then in verse twenty six. There in verse twenty six, David says, "Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God?" We see it again in verse 36, if you jump down from 26 to 36, where David says the same thing. Your servant, he's talking to Saul, and he says, Your servant has killed lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine 
will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Again, if you skip down a little farther, verse 45, David speaks to Goliath saying, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So David has a major problem with this Philistine defying the armies of the living God and defying God himself. And he, he, listen, our God is not mocked. Our God is not mocked. Our whole goal in life ought to be to make the world say the God of the Christians is a big God. He is a great God. He is the only God who deserves all glory and honor and praise. He is an awesome God. He is holy, holy, holy. Listen, the glory of God is at stake here. And this is what David sees. David sees this. I mean, what a mark of a man right there. He wants his God to be glorified. He's an awesome God. He's a holy God. And so the way you react to Goliath should scream to the world, my God is great. The way that you treat your spouse, men, should scream, my God is great. The way that you treat your kids should scream to the world, my God is great. The way that you spend your money should, should just show the world, my God is great. The way that you dress, the, the way that you parent your kids, the way that you date young people, the way that you talk, the way that you uh, do anything, the way that you watch or what you watch on TV, what you look at on the internet, what you surf along the, those different web pages, all of it should scream, my God is great. When I preach, sometimes in the open air, I sometimes do open air preaching, and uh, you know, my primary goal is not to get converts. My primary goal is that those that would listen would at least realize that preacher has a great God. He preaches of a great God of all the universe. They might, they might not believe in him, but I want them to at least see that I believe my God is is great. In this story, it, Goliath and the Philistines, they're mocking the God of Israel. There's this giant out there defying the armies of the living God, and David wasn't going to put up with it one minute. He seems to look at the whole situation as if God had given him a special mission, a mission to defend God's honor. This was going to be risky. It doesn't really seem that David really even thinks of the risk involved. This is, this is a huge risk. But you know what? Risk is right. It is right to take risks sometimes. And this is one of those times. They had just faced 40 days of nothing but fear. The Israelites, nothing but fear for 40 days. And David came onto the scene and he thought... I'm going to take a risk. I'm risking it all. I am going for it. I, I am not letting the fear factor paralyze me from fighting in the Lord's battles. I'm getting out of my safety zone, my comfort zone. I'm getting out and, and I am going to fight in the Lord's battles. I might have to do it all alone, but God is on my side and that's all that matters. It's all that matters. If God is for me, who can be against me? I'm waging war against the Philistines, and if God is for us, who can be against us? Some of you are familiar with that, that quote uh, by that famous missionary to India. They call him the father of modern missions, William Carey. William Carey said this, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. What a great statement. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That's precisely what David does right here. Some risks are worth taking. And when it has to do with God's honor, it's worth taking. We live in a time of cowardice. Let's just be honest. We live in a time of cowardice. Most men are cowards. One of the main characteristics of a conqueror is that he's willing to take risks. 
He knows that it might mean losing his life, but that's a risk he's willing to take. This is how a martyr thinks. This is the martyr mentality, martyr in, in a good way. This is how a martyr thinks. He thinks, listen, I'm not of this world. I'm just a stranger and an alien here. I'm a foreigner. I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. I'm on my way to the celestial city. I'm here for a very short amount of time. And my, my life is just like a, a blink of the eye or a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If they kill me, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This life is so short in comparison to eternity. An eternal perspective. This is the perspective of a martyr. This is the perspective that David has right here. Eternal perspective. The big picture. You know, uh, Jonathan Edwards, I guess it was, who said this all the time. Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeball. Stamp eternity on my eyeballs. What a great statement. I, I, I'm taking on Goliath. I can hear those calls from that giant. Give me a man. Give me a man. I'm that man. I'm going to fight in the Lord's battles. And now, lastly, this third point. Uh, so many other things to touch on, but for the sake of time, just three points here. This third thing is, is there not a God is there not a God? And, and this idea kind of falls out of these verses uh, 46 and 47. As you look at that, David states basically his goal as he goes into this fight. His goal is this, that all the earth might know that there is a God in Israel. Is there a God in Israel? That, that's kind of the question, and it seems like what, what, what the, the giant and what the Philistines are, are taunting the Israelites. There's, your God isn't going to save you. Who is the God of the Israelites? Is there a God in Israel? Does God really exist? I mean, putting religion aside, is there really an all-powerful God out there? The answer is a resounding, yes, there is. Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 20, that famous verse, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. All of creation screams of a Creator, screams of a God who spoke it all into existence. Is there a God? Yes, there is. There is only one true God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's transcendent. He is love and he is justice. He is truth and he is mercy. He is the creator of all things. He is holy, holy, holy. He is triune. That is one God revealed in three persons who are equal in essence, but different in role and function. This great God has revealed himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. David is a type of Jesus. It's amazing. Do you read this story and you think about it? Really, David is a type looking forward to Jesus in this story. Uh, Goliath, he's a type of the devil. Here we have the drama of salvation being acted out in this great valley, in this battlefield. The drama of the story of salvation. David and Goliath and the gospel, you could say. David was the shepherd of his father's sheep. Jesus is the shepherd of his father's sheep. David went about his father's business. Jesus went about his father's business. You remember David was sent by his father to take this some business to his brothers? Um, David was sent by his father. Jesus was sent by his father. David's brothers rejected him. Jesus' brothers rejected him. David became the champion and the king. Jesus became the champion and the king. God's champion beats the devil's champion. God's champion won the battle. Therefore, we need not cower in fear. Jesus is the real giant killer. 
Jesus is on every page of the scriptures. The giant has been overcome by Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Is there not a God? Yes, there is. Listen, 95% of the world, I, I don't know percentages here. I'm just throwing a percentage out there. It's a great percentage. 95% of the world doesn't know our God. 95% of this world is lost in sin and, and going to hell. They have no idea how great our God is. I think you and I have a mission, don't we? Oh, we've got a mission. A mission has been set before us that the world might know that there is a God in Israel. There is a God in Canada. There is a God in the United States. There is a God in Peru. There is a God in South Africa. There is a God. He's my God. It is him that we proclaim. Colossians 1.28, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Preach the gospel. That's your mission. Today, that is our mission. Make Christ's name great. Evangelism, discipleship, church planting, missions. One thing that I want to bring out here is in this story, faith. When David was faced with a giant problem, he acted abnormally, <laughs> abnormally compared to most people. He ran toward the problem instead of away from it. David seems to be almost eager to take this huge risk. Look at verse 22 in this chapter 17. Verse 22, it says, David ran to the ranks and he went and he greeted his brothers. Then in verse 48, it says, David ran quickly toward the battle line. Then in verse 51, it says, David ran and he stood over the Philistine. David was an all in kind of guy. He went for it without hesitation. He made, he, what made him do this? It's like, what, what kind of, this guy's different. He's abnormal. This guy's weird. He's strange. Here we have lessons on faith from a teenager. Lessons on faith from a teenager. He was just a youth, but he was a giant slayer. What was David's spiritual secret? Faith. Faith was his natural reflex. Is faith your natural reflex or is fear? That's not normal. Most of us, it, 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 we have fear. That's our natural reflex. Do you face your giants with faith or with fear? Faith changes everything. This changes absolutely everything. True faith involves really three components, if you think about it. There, emotion, information, and an act of the will. You put those three things together and you've got biblical saving faith. Emotion, it, it, faith does involve emotion. But it can't be just emotion. You'll get in a lot of trouble. But a lot of false doctrine comes from just emotion without information. You've got to join that emotion with information. But then you've got to act on it. An act of the will. And, and you see that in this story. Emotion. David hears the, the giant say, give me a man. And, and then he sees, there's this mission that God has given me. A mission. I am not going to let that guy defy the armies of the living God. And you see this emotion within David as he runs to his brothers. He runs to the giant. He runs to cut off his head. Emotion is there. But he's also got it and he's coupled this emotion with information. Our God, this is the information. Our God is the one and only true God of the universe. And I desire to make his name great. I want everyone here on this battlefield to know who the true God is. That's the information that David is dealing with right here. And then an act of the will. Trusting in the Lord, I'm running in. I am running in there. He acts on the information and the emotion that God has given him. Oh, give me a man. Give me a man. So now I've tried to set before you a little bit of context about the man David. This guy was a warrior. 
This guy was a poet. He was a lover. He was a friend. He's a worshiper of the living God. And we see as, as these things are set before us here, it, it, Goliath comes out every single morning and he faces the giant. He goes out there and it's kind of like, give me a man, I'll be that man. And, and then he answers this other question, is there not a cause? Yes, there is. The cause is to make our, our God's name great among the nations. And then, is there not a God? Yes, there is. And he fights for me. Oh, brothers and sisters, may the Lord raise up men, men after his own heart. Give me a man. Give me a man. Give me a man. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would raise up a generation of men, men that recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and men that are willing to fight battles men that recognize there is a cause and they're willing to stand up for it no matter what the cost so lord we pray that you would raise up men in jesus name amen